So welcome to another conversation of cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. And today I am very glad and honored to have here as guest Alberto Perez Gomez. Alberto Perez Gomez studied architecture and practice in Mexico City. In 1983, he became director of Charlton University School of Architecture in Ottawa, Canada. Since 1987, occupied the Bronfen Chair at McGill University, where he founded the History and Theory postgraduate programs. His books include Architecture and the Crisis of Modern Science, Polyphilio, Architectural Representation and the Perspective Hinge, Built Upon Love, Architectural Longing After Ethics and Aesthetics, Attunement and Timely Meditations. Alberto, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we uh, prepared for this conversation, me and the students, by watching the link with the lecture you sent us, with, and, and also with the, with the papers that you, that you shared with us from, from your book, Attunement. And I would like to invite you perhaps to start this conversation by asking you, uh, how did you get interested in this topic of Stimmung? Because I think that it's also such a nice coincidence that we are doing this seminar in Germany and perhaps our German students weren't even so aware of the connections of, of the concept of Stimmung in the German language and how it can connect to architecture. Yes, that's a very interesting question. I guess, if, if I'm not mistaken, Stimmung is a, it's a neologism uh, in German uh, of the late 18th, early 19th century, coined by, by um, a group of, uh, of philosophers, really, that are generally um, uh, categorized as romantic philosophers. They, 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 they produce a, a body of work that is kind of consistent uh, among themselves. And, and they coined this word, uh, which of course in, in normal German parlance uh, is mood, something you know, like, like I bring this mood to, to, to the conversation, I feel sad or something. It's supposed to be, it's a, it's a, it's a condition of, uh, of, of affectivity. Uh, but they, they bring it into the conversation to speak about how, how art conveys its meanings, how the, the meaning of art is not something intellectual, is not something that is given to the, to, 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 the, to the intellect as a representation, but it's something that is first experienced in the heart. So they also speak about gemüt, about this organ of sentience that is kind of in between the stomach and the real heart, the real heart, right, the pump, uh, and that is where we are affected and where we feel, and therefore this is the, the this is, they understand it as the as the place where we become cognizant through artistic phenomena or through emotional phenomena, because it also involves, of course, nature uh, in, in for, for the romantic uh, thinkers. They are, they are important because they represent, and, you, and I'm, I'm coming to your question, how did I come to, to be connected to that? So I'll, I'll, I'll get there. They are important because they, they constitute the first, uh, rather, uh, not the first, because there were, some, there were some other philosophers before them, like Spinoza or Maine de Biran in France in the 18th century, but they represent the first uh, really body of organized thinking that is very anti-Cartesian. It's really a kind of uh, a questioning of Cartesian, uh, the tenets of Cartesian, of, of dualistic understanding of, of, of existence in general. And so they become, they, they come eventually to be understood as a kind of foundation for other modes of philosophical endeavor that result in the 20th century phenomenology and more recent neurophenomenology, uh, you know, and that carry forward this, uh, this uh, um, questioning, radical questioning of an understanding of reality through a dualistic uh, framework, which is what we carry, well, what contemporary technological world carries from, from Cartesianism. So in a certain sense, they become really the, like the foundation for this um, series of, um, of endeavors into the 19th, 20th, 21st century that keep questioning these tenets of dualistic, uh, uh, of, of dualism as, 
as the framework to understand uh, reality. So I came to it really through, through the, actually in reverse, because I was myself first interested in existential philosophy when I was younger, particularly in Mexico by reading Jose Ortega Gasset, uh, who with Heidegger studied with Husserl. So I first read that stuff in Spanish. He's very nice in Spanish. He's a very good writer, Ortega. Uh, very different from Heidegger, who was much more technical and is inventing all these words. Uh, uh, Ortega, if you read it in Spanish, is beautiful because it really uses the language uh, really from the bottom up. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very rich uh, Castilian Spanish. And so I became interested in that first. And then I came, of course, to Heidegger and to Husserl and to phenomenology. But, but then eventually I understood, I understood better the lineage of this kind of thinking that has its roots uh, in, 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 in earlier contestations of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the cat, which indeed go back to, to, to Spinoza or come th also through Vico and hermeneutics. And, that, uh, and, and of course, Stimmung, this understanding of, of, of meaning, let me put it this way, a meaning that is fundamentally emotional. So that because, because in Cartesian understanding of, 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 of things, we tend to believe that meaning is intellectual, is something that happens as associations in the brain, and that therefore anything in the world, including art, has to convey meanings that way. Whereas these guys radically question that. They basically recover something which was well known, I think, in, in, in it's really, it's, it's really the concept of aesthesis, but in the original Greek sense, which is meaning given in a in a, in, a, in in the fundamental uh, we could say today interface between embodied being and the world, which is fundamentally emotional. So you cannot separate emotion or affect from uh, from intellectual meaning. They they come together, and that's those are the meanings that really matter, and those are the meanings that that of course art and architecture are fundamentally. Uh, prepared to convey, right? So it's a very important conversation because what happens really in architecture is that because of the cat, uh, the, 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 the understanding of architectural meaning gets reduced to something intellectual already in the work of Claude Perrault in the late 17th century. And it passed, it's passed on to all contemporary, modern contemporary architectural thinking so that architects always struggle with this problem because they try to, to Imagine that architectural meanings are conveyed like something intellectual, as an association, rather than something that is fundamentally emotional. You know, it's the, the modern world tends to be very suspicious of emotion as effective cognition, whereas Stimmung in the in the in the original way that it's used in the by the by the uh, um, German philosophers is actually deliberately a kind of cognition which is fundamentally emotional. Mm -hmm speaks directly to the heart. I, I find it very interesting that you, that you mentioned specifically uh, in the text that you shared with us before, the, the work of the neuroscientist Damasio, for example, because he wrote, it, I think it was his first bestseller and uh, breakthrough, he wrote the Descartes' Error this book, which was exactly to say that until now we thought that we had the body and we had the mind and the emotions and logic and the two hemispheres separated. And he really brought this completely new paradigm uh, in, in neuroscience that, that uh, changed everything. That's because right. um, Damasio even uh, proposes that our emotions, um, they are really the first impulses that lead to, to action and reaction as, as the basis of everything, including more logical, we would say, lo logical uh, decisions. Yes, exactly. No, I am very much, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with Damasio. You know, I, 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 I don't remember what the dates of, the, of Damasio's book are, but for me, it became like, a, the, the, my interest in neuroscience for me has become more a kind of vindication of things that I, I always was convinced of, but I could not really demonstrate. So to have a, a neuroscientist do it for me is, has been amazing. You know, and there are other people that are kindred, uh, like in an active cognitive, uh, 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 in, in, you know, an active cognitive scientists uh, and uh, the, the, the neurophenomenological approaches of someone like, like uh, Alva Noe or, or Ivan Thompson, 
that I like very much, which are really in the same line, you know, where the, you, you take seriously the, the affective side of things as part of cognition. Uh, yes, and I also find it very interesting that you mentioned this because I remember when I was an, an architecture student, whenever I wanted to bring in my projects something that de dealt with emotions, because I wanted to be an artist when, when I was growing up. And then I went to architecture because I thought it's the mother of all arts and then th this is where everything fuses. And then the reality really did not meet my expectations at all. Of course, <laughs> of course not, because you know, these things are separated. So you, you should go to art school, you don't belong here. But I, I persisted. And even when I started with my PhD, I really wanted to work with this topic of, of emotions in architecture. Um, and, and it was a challenge, uh, but, but it was also an opportunity because this new knowledge from neuroscience shows that now we can prove it. it we are not just having some intuitions to justify romantic in, in the derogatory sense uh, inclinations. These things really have, uh, have a connection and, and the romantics were very right in many, in many ideas they were proposed. I, I, I certainly believe so. I'm also aware of the fact that this is very contested. You know, I just came, I was looking in, the, in uh, Amazon for something else. And of course, you know how it is, this, this web, uh, this, this uh, search engines that know what you are interested in. And, and there was, there's a book there that I haven't bought. I don't know what it is about, but it's some kind of neuroscientist that wrote a book called Damasio's Error. Right? <laughs> Making fun of Damasio. I don't know, this is very recent, but I know this is, prof this is profoundly contested. You know, I know we know from the conversations with our colleagues, uh, th there is nothing we can do. I mean, it's very complicated because you know where it, where I think it becomes very, very uh, uh, powerful, this problem is when we deal really with questions of consciousness that have to do with, uh, with medical ethics. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where it really becomes very complicated, right? Because I don't know, I wouldn't know, you know, the, the, one of the issues about the uncertainties about human consciousness is the concept of, uh, the medical concept of brain death, mm -hmm. which is a very tricky problem, as you know, you know, when you, when the doctor can say, well, he's, it's, be, it's, it's finished, you know, he's connected, he seems to be alive or she, but he's not because the, the, the brain is dead. There is no consciousness. And this is a very tricky problem. Uh, on the one hand, you know, if I were faced with a situation like that with a, with a, with a family member, I, I probably would agree with the doctor, you know, what's the point? But on the other hand, uh, there is this incredible uncertainty about this question of where the consciousness actually resides. So that's, I'm very aware of that, you know, this is something very interesting. Uh, and I, and I, I, that's why neuroscientists that are like square, that basically believe that the consciousness is in the brain, uh, would, 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 would swear that no matter what I say, or Damasio says, or anybody with greater authority than me, uh, you know, it's still an issue. But, uh, but that's, I think that's the state of the question now. And I, I don't have anything to add. I just know what I believe in, you know. <laughs> but, but in the end, it, it really has to do with the, with the set of evidence that is presented to you. It's interesting that now the evidence also appears through, through scientific experimentation. And I think that's fantastic. But in the end, I think one would have to admit that we don't know. Yes, it's the, the famous big problem of neuroscience, right? How this, it's uh, how the self comes to be. Mm. I don't know. I'm not, I'm, you know, maybe the, I know that there are like hundreds of books on this and I, I cannot uh, I pretend to be, uh, to, to have read everything. You know, I've read a few things, but, and I know that there is big questions. Well, the, the, not just a few things and also the way they are articulated, uh, they, they are wonderful in the way that that they they show how relevant uh, these these ideas are also for us, for us in, in architecture and in design. Uh, and also because um, it's also a way to try to find answers to some fundamental human uh, questions about consciousness and also about about meaning I and mean, about our place our place in the world and i also found very interesting that uh, in your lecture that you and also in the in your texts that you mentioned this uh, question of purpose uh, mm -hmm. because even these um, these uh, rem remnants from a thousand years ago that we we recognize were purposefully uh, built um, we can definitely 
speculate in a more scientific sense how these actions how they were somehow possible because of the brains uh, and the body, the, the capacities, but how by performing these actions, perhaps we also developed our consciousness um, further. So perhaps you would like to, to comment what, what in your opinion from all the knowledge you have acquired over the years? Yes, I, I, I do speak of purpose. I am fascinated by this problem. Here, I think the contribution that I found really fantastically relevant is from the side of the so-called neurophenomenology, uh, particularly the, the contributions of, um, of Barella, you know, the, the famous uh, evolutionary uh, 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 biologist from Chile, who, uh, who was very close to Ivan Thompson before, they, before he passed away. And, uh, and he was extremely fascinating individual. Uh, uh, you, you, you probably know that with Maturana, they developed this, uh, they, basically they were trying to look at the difference between, uh, trying to define life. What is life? You know, it's, it's really a neat, very interesting question. Uh, today people speak about life, uh, the life of things. It's, a, it's an interesting problem. What is alive and, 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 and what isn't? These guys, again, I'm, 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 I'm no expert here and I'm, I'm just going to be making a kind of, a, 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 I'm paraphrasing off the top of my head and probably simplifying too much. But, uh, but what, they, what they discovered, which I think is very convincing, is, uh, is that, that, uh, that what characterizes life is the concept of autopoiesis, which is, basically what differentiates a bacterium from a virus. The virus, you know, that has us <laughs> that, that we are, we are so, we've been so uh, like really screwed up with <laughs> for so many months. This virus, but the virus actually in itself is not something that is alive because it's not autopoietic. It's basically, um, it's, it's, it needs, um, uh, um, a living cell to, to perpetuate itself, yes. And they, they came up with this formulation where they, because you know, the, the, the issue of what is the origin of life, how does it originate? Because we know, well, when we've been told that, you know, it's, we can think of life as basically a, a component of four chemical, of four chemical elements, right? Uh, the, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen uh, that we all know from our classes in, in uh, in organic chemistry, at least I had to take that when I was in high school. Uh, and, and so it's very reductive, you know, the idea that you can actually understand life basically as, as atoms, uh, 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 these four elements that combine and make life. But what is actually, what characterizes it is, is that, it is, it's that, the, it's that the, the way that it comes together is through an autopoietic bacterium, which means that it has the capacity, this, this uh, monocellular organism has the capacity to abide in life. It has a metabolic system, uh, has a membrane. I mean, it's, it's, they, they make, you know, it, but it's very simple, but basically what comes out of this, I'm, I'm jumping here, but is that, that this autopoietic system basically already generates meaning when it goes for the little grain of sugar that keeps it alive. It's already meaning, so that the, the bacterium is alive and is also already conscious. So that the consciousness and life are really yoked in a fundamental way. Consciousness and life are yoked. You, cannot have, you don't have life without consciousness. And of course, consciousness becomes much more complex with the multicellular organisms, plants, animals and ourselves, we have a very big brain. But what happens with this, uh, when you understand it that way, it's a question of purpose, right? <laughs> the autopoiesis to stay alive, really, is already the constitution of, of this meaning, yes, of a recognition of this purpose of staying alive of the organism. That is something that is characteristic of sentient life. That's why the ancients in our Western cultures uh, particularly pre-modern, pre-Cartesian, also pre-Christian, because Christianity is crucial, 
things in the way that it conceives of animals as inferior to humans mm -hmm. in, in the creation, right? But, but generally, world cultures are extremely um, careful with, with animal sentience. The Greeks would really be, you know, like Aristotle really meant it when he said that the only difference between a horse and a man is that the man speaks. The horse is basically like us, but it's alogo. It doesn't speak, right? So it's very fascinating because the, the, it's really this little 20% of representational consciousness that is ours that allows this conversation we are having. But as you know, we're very much like monkeys in, in our genetic uh, constitution. But that, that is really something that makes it more difficult for us to recognize purpose. Like we can convince ourselves that life is meaningless and go and kill ourselves. But this is really the function of our higher brain of this representational consciousness. So this is why religious practices, mysticism, all this really brings us close to our animality Right? It really has to do, it's something that Bataille understood very well and that people sometimes are horrified. But Bataille, you know, I mean, I remember having a conversation with uh, Alain Robbegrier who, who came to visit here, we invited him, we were quite, uh, but, and he said, Bataille, Bataille is just a Christian, you know, he's just a very religious man. Even though, of course, you know, he's profoundly, you know, he's all the contestation, uh, the interest in eroticism, in, in violence. Uh, but it's, it's, these questions are, Something that we, as, uh, if, uh, as modern humans, Cartesian, we don't really like to think about that. How all these things that really matter and that our, our very understanding of purpose really has to do with our animal being more than with anything else. And so bringing, that, bringing us back to that, I think, when we think about architecture or works of art is really, I think, where we find these conditions, you know, and, and uh, artists, of course, very often do it intuitively. Uh, but, uh, but so that's why I, and, and yes, I think that that's part of what architecture can do for humans, emotionally, uh, bring them, bring back this possibility of understanding in a way that is not intellectual, the, 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 the purposefulness of being here, uh, you know, in, in, in the way that we feel beauty or we feel, like when something, when we are, when we, when we have, we attend a beautiful dance performance or an amazing movie, or we read a beautiful poem, we feel our life is uh, enhanced. Yes, it's enriched in a way that we want to keep living. We thirst for this space of, uh, you know, this desire for desire, which is always unfinished, mm -hmm. but which really the, 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 the the artistic event, whichever form it may take, uh, um, uh, provokes in our experience. So I, I think that's what I mean by, 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 by this. When I evoke this question of purpose in most of my writing, I think that's what I, but, but yes, it's, I, I find it fascinating that, 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 not, that uh, for me, it was a revelation to, to read uh, to read uh, Ivan Thompson and Varela on this question of uh, autopoiesis. And, and because it's fascinating, you know, and they went, uh, I remember they were, uh, they were at some point invited by the Dalai Lama to wow. speak. Uh, you know, the Dalai Lama had these amazing conferences. I think he's too old now, but he used to invite these scientists to talk about these things, you know, and, and of course in Buddhism, well, the, the, the concept of reincarnation means somehow some belief in something that is not organic that doesn't have an organic base that can perhaps come back or whatever. But the Dalai Lama, after hearing this uh, um, exposition by, this, uh, by these two guys, agreed with him, said, you know, really, I cannot disagree with you that consciousness, human consciousness has to have an organic base. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, that's what the Buddhists like about uh, their, uh, their, their, uh, their practices. You know, we have the evidence that, that uh, an accomplished meditator may die meditating and the body does not corrupt until three months later. Yes, this, this is also like, it has been ascertained. And so there is, no, there is no physiological explanation of this 
right? So it's complicated, this question of consciousness is that somehow, the, I think the Buddhists really believe that the, that the, that the, the consciousness takes time to, to disappear from the body. It's not this idea that you are brain dead, mm -hmm. right? That's it. Yeah. So this, and they have this vindication, you know, they have these practices where they actually observe these things. And so the Dalai Lama said, well, you know, we have to leave this as a question. But I agree with you, consciousness is yoked to life. Something that if you ask a Catholic or a Protestant, probably they would never agree, right? So that's interesting when you, when, so anyhow, that's, um, that's where I, well, this is this question of purpose that is really about animal, it's really animal sentience. Uh, but it's also very interesting how you relate this this to these connections to, for example, you mentioned to Buddhism, and I had to think, for example, in um, uh, Steiner philosophy, um, and and uh, I, I, I was for some time interested in Steiner philosophy, and I am a certified uh, Waldorf uh, art education teacher. I did this training program and in the beginning I was very lost because I was not, I grew up in a Catholic family, so um, I, I don't really go to church, but of course I had this influence and um, I also didn't, didn't go to a Waldorf school. So in the beginning I was a complete alien in this, in this uh, environment and I did this training here in Stuttgart. And what's really interesting about uh, Waldorf education and also Steiner philosophy is that through very practical exercises that deal with material like clay or stone or painting or so, um, these exercises which are done by hand or with the whole body, they really have this purpose of developing an awareness of the connection between consciousness, the body and, and the material manifest world. Uh, and uh, what I also find really interesting was that Rudolf Steiner actually, he, he developed his own kind of architecture and it had some rules and, and also was connected to, to his uh, philosophy. Uh, and, and it was a whole repertoire of shapes that he believed uh, had a direct impact in the human body because they represented exactly our, our movements and the connection to the emotions and that this could somehow induce uh, in, our, in our body and our being psychosomatic health, which is also something that you mention very often in your work. Do, do you know a little bit more about this or? I know a little bit about Steiner. I have been in the Gotteneum. I, I, I have read a little bit. I had a, a student uh, that did once a master's uh, thesis on, uh, on Steiner, but I'm not, I'm not a specialist. I really would not have much to add to, to what you well, said. I, Maria, I Maria, I, I have once, um, uh, well, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of Steiner, Steiner and um, here in California, there's Ward, Waldorf schools that we did some painting. So he has this color, colors that align with um, the uh, um, education level or like the, the cognitive development level uh, by, by, by age. And so yeah. each room has to be painted in this certain glowing kind of color. And there's a, a lazure, lazure painting method. And so I, I was trained in it. Um, because one of my clients uh, sent his, his, um, his child there. And it's this layering, layering, layering effect of very, very thin pigments that then it was amazing what we, what we and, and just like four or five of us were following this artist around the room as, as he like kind of instructed us. And it was just this beautiful, it was almost a meditation. So I, I, the, whole, the whole process, I highly recommend um, it was embodied, it embodied, it was, it was amazing. And I, <clears throat> I, I can talk about it later in my talk, but it, this, yeah, this is a very, very interesting topic. Very, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lily, for, for uh, bringing this up. Yes, and, and I thought about it in connection to one of the topics that Alberto mentions very often, which is this idea of using architecture in space. And, and this example with color is really good because we know scientifically that color has an effect uh, on, on, on our body and it's measurable and also sound. Um, but I would also like to pick the thread up again because um, 
some uh, German expressionist uh, architects, they were very influenced by, by these experiments of Steiner. So maybe Alberto, you could uh, comment on that. No, I know about it as well, Maria, but I don't know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not certainly an expert on, on German expressionism. Uh, I think that, that, uh, that there is a whole dimension of uh, contemporary architecture that has been generally uh, one, I could I, I always imagine as a kind of uh, um, uh, bulk, uh, a kind of uh, bastion of resistance to the kind of more to the more reductive uh, uh, thinking of architectural design as a, as a, as a geometric construction through descriptive geometry, and which really has to do with all these traditions of uh, of craft and making. I don't, you know, I, I, I think one can, of course, there, one would have to differentiate and, and, and they're all quite different, obviously. But I, I really believe uh, uh, deeply that the kind of uh, knowledge that one develops through, uh, through making, precisely by engaging in these processes in one way or another, uh, is a, a incredibly important uh, to, as a foundation for anything that you can then represent. So that, that all these skills, and that we know from neuroscience as well, uh, all these skills that we have, these motor sensory skills, actually affect your, your, your cognitive capacity. So you, 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 regardless of, of the concept, of the, of the context in which you will eventually end up designing, for example, if you're a student of architecture, the fact that you have a, a, a training in, in, in these material skills that you actually take the time and the, the love that goes into making things uh, and, and learning the skills is something fundamental to architectural ed education. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, a lot of this, uh, there, are, there are a number of, con of contemporary and modern uh, architects that have understood this, you know, that, uh, that, that this is really fundamental. Uh, but today, unfortunately, in architectural schools, uh, it's mostly it's mostly computers, and uh, and I, I think we have we still have to. I mean, for me, it's self-evident that that the richness of the world, even when I experience it naively, you know, where I don't know who built or who designed whatever, the the richness of the world really has to do with these material qualities much more than with the intellectual uh, uh, issues. So to not uh, to not grant that in our uh, architect architectural educational programs is actually extremely problematic. And it's one of the things that really troubles me constantly. Uh, you know, well, that, that's all I would say, because I, I really would not be able to, to elaborate on, on German expressionism. <laughs> no problem. I, I was just mostly curious. Um, but that, that's about what you, what you mean. It exactly makes the, the connection with the topics that I'm trying to also to bring together with this uh, course. And also, uh, you know, the exercise that our students, they are working on this shelter. And I gave them some references, for example, from Arte Povera that really went back to working with very material things and connecting to nature, but also with, with technology. And also uh, my students are prepared with a series of physical exercises that, that I recorded as audio instructions. And it's a mix of my own experiments with performance art and yoga and other body techniques. And, um, and I have been applying these exercises to almost all the courses I've teach, to furniture design, interior design and ergonomics. And I really notice that the, that our students feel very motivated to to work in this way because the more we work with the computer, the less connected to the full range of our bodies and our sensory experiences we can feel. And now with all this exper ex ex experience we have with with COVID, we are even more aware of how uh, fundamental it is that that we that we connect to our body as a way to connect to connect to the world. Yes, absolutely. We we had a when I had a, when I started this master's program that became also a PhD eventually at, at at McGill. We had three components. We had, of course, we had we had history of architectural theories. We had a, a, a component on philosophy of architecture, a little bit phenomenology, and then eventually neuroscience or or uh, some concepts of the stuff that we've been talking about. But the third component, which was very crucial for us, was a studio that was experimental studio. It was not we were not designing buildings. We were actually encouraging students to do work with their hands 
as a way to think about their thesis projects. So it's a curious way, you know, like inverting, like the, 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 the studio was like a thesis preparation work for the research. And we got some amazing results, you know, and, and uh, eventually we ran out as a, we ran that also as a, as a more organized studio when we changed the program. And, and uh, in fact, it's interesting because the, you, the project that you are running, uh, the, that, the, that you kindly sent me, the uh, uh, Naked in the Sun project, uh, my wife, Louise, ran a project for the, for the master's program on this question of uh, urban nomadism. So we, we were, you know, we, we did a lot of this and it was very fruitful. That I think the students really uh, managed to understand uh, eventually theoretical questions that were much more powerful, poignant and focused through the design work that that often was very on on premeditated you know we did, we never i always insisted that it was not like a, like your typical studio where you almost already know where you're going to arrive before you start which is very problematic it's really this kind of planning mentality but really to engage the process in order to be able to 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 learn by making uh, uh, and uh, we you know sometimes it was very difficult we had students from all over the world that had came to the program already formed as architects with this idea that architectural design was planning mm -hmm. and they had an incredible difficulty letting go of that <laughs> right like the, the the which is something that for any artist you're familiar with you are you know you you're, you engage with the material through some bodily skills and then you discover things and and you you discover things and this is what i always used to tell the students you you you, are, you manage to produce things that you didn't know you were capable of producing if you can let go it's unbelievable right because because it's incredible this wisdom that is uh, uh, the skills in the of the of the body that we don't trust mm -hmm. generally as architects or, or sometimes yeah. we might we might because we're not used to working with them That's we right. might think that we are not capable of uh, for example it might be I, I know from my own experience because i i grew up in a, in a kind of a suburb of Portugal that I didn't have much room to play outside because it wasn't very safe and so so I grew I grew up very introverted not very good with my body and it was all very difficult and it was in the middle of my studies of architecture when I started to practice yoga that it was like a, a, a entering a new planet and I could see how through this connection to my body, my perception of the world, my experience, my connection to people, my curiosity and my creativity, how it was expanding and how and how I could really feel and I wanted to apply this in design. And 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 I and it has been really my purpose, so to say, to share this very personal experience with, with my colleagues and also with my students, because I think it works and I think it's really important. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, can I make a comment? Yes, please. I would like to give not to the audience. Yes. Well, I just, uh, you know, per, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I gave you a tour of the Salk Institute and it was one of the memories of my life that was just wonderful. It was you and, and Yohani Palazma and his well, wife. Yes, Lily, of course. <laughs> okay. I, I treasure those moments. We spent a few hours together in one of the most yeah, beautiful. It was places amazing. On the I, I'm, I'm actually writing a little memory about it, actually. <laughs> oh my gosh, my whole my whole dissertation was about memories of the Salk Institute. Uh, I'll have to share my my dissertation with you. Yes, so, um, uh, such a. So how did we? I have a question for you for for the class. Well, oh, well, you know what? I'm I'm going to present in a couple of weeks, and I have pictures of the Salk Institute, and I'm going to recollect um, some of the amazing things that I learned from uh, Perez Gomez, uh, Dr. Gomez. Thank you so much. Um, so there's just one, one thing that comes up between the dialogue between uh, Maria and Alberto is this, for me, it's almost like um, architecture is like riding a bike to me. And so there are many different entry points that we have, like some people are the, dominated by the sense of, of sight so they you know or or sound or or texture or and there's different entry points into this realm of architecture which is an engagement of the body so we can study a bicycle we could think how beautiful it looks you know and its sense of proportion and the way it expresses you know um physics or the way it expresses motion or the way it expresses and but what, what we won't and we can study it and we can take it apart and we can 
see the history of it and all this stuff. But until we actually ride the bicycle and engage all of our senses and the balance, and but we're all drawn to it for a different reason. But the but the joy, the actual joy, and that's where this Buddhism, because I'm also a practicing Buddhist, really comes in in this engagement of you know different knowledge. We have, and I also wonder why I wondered why architects were not famous or really, really confident in their skills until they were much older. And I find that, you know, the profession of educator and architect, I, I was drawn to both because we value this wisdom that uh, Alberto is talking about, this wisdom of engagement of, of not only what is, what is pleasurable or intellectually stimulating about proportions and and all of the different principles of architecture, but also in the making and the doing and the experiencing that comes over years, years yeah. of experience on this planet. I mean, I'm in my fifties and I, I'm just starting to think about architecture and really making architecture. And I feel like my sixties, my seventies, my eighties, you know, there was no way that I could have been the way I am in my twenties or my, you know? And I just feel like uh, for all the students that it's such an exciting, profession once you realize it's an engagement of all the senses that's all i wanted to say yes thank you Billy. you're absolutely right yes uh i don't i would like also to ask if there's any more uh, uh comments or questions sarah i think i think you would like to say something but you have to un unmute yourself yeah. oh hi hi alberto i always hi, Sarah, how are you you and um you know i've also been thinking about autopoiesis and i've come across something new by this writer named her name is anna singh and she's an anthropologist and she talks about symbiopoiesis because there's no such thing as auto like nothing happens in isolation we always grow out of a situation and it's always a back and forth yeah. And so symb symb if we think of symbiosis, you know, these all all of life is symbiotic. Yes. And, and if we look at po I, I think I think in the way that, in the way that Barella and uh, and the, the 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 well the people in, in his lab, all these people that were uh, trying to to define the nature of life. I think they would really understand that very clearly, you know, that that's what they mean by autopoiesis. It's really a quality of the, what, what is auto is the capacity to abide in life as an enclosed metabolic system. But it's not closed. Well, but the metabolic system is closed. You, of course, need the, the environment. This is what you mean by symbiosis. But the metabolic uh, system is in itself closed. Well, it's not though, because we breathe and we need food for- Yes, yes of course, but it's, it has this kind of membrane, the, the, the yeah, bacteria yes. inside. Yeah, yeah but, but, the, but see, I think, I think that they probably would have agreed with symbiopoiesis. Yes, if, yes, I don't think there is a contradiction. If they, if they would have gone further in that line of thinking. What, what? That's fine, Sarah, but what does it add to, to the definition of life? It adds a whole world of mutuality and a way of understanding that interdependence, I think. Oh, there, well, that's, there's, simplicity, there's... that's simplicity in, 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 in their work. Look, if you look at their work at, at uh, Barella, uh, Thompson and Rausch's quite famous little book of 1990 called The... the uh, the embodied mind. There, they actually one of the one of their important reference points is the the is precisely this concept of coemergence that appears, I think, for the first time ever in the fifth century BC, in the writings of the of the Buddhist philosopher Nargayuna, who's actually elaborating things from Hinduism, but who basically states very clearly that neither the subject nor the object nor the action that connects the subject to an object can actually be postulated as autonomous and more real than any of the other two so that yeah, 
so that there is co conversion. Yes, right? yes. He really, they really understand that. No, so I know, I know they do, and I've read the book, and I think okay. that that autopoiesis is 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 more aptly called symbiopoiesis, and I just, right. I just so know. can I. Can I just say that it's a union of the two. There's there's a concept in Buddhism called esho. Well, it's in Japanese. It's esho fumi, which means two but not two. So that's like the essence. So the the idea that um, that we are one but we're not one. There's there's a centr centrality of consciousness that I cannot feel, Sarah. What you're you're feeling, I cannot. Right. So that is the boundary of existence. However, because we're having a dialogue, we're two. We're all so it's almost like you know you would think of uh, waves on a, on an ocean. So we see them as individual waves, but it's really one. So this this inherent contradiction in life is that we are we are in the world as a s autonomous living being that you know defends ourselves from you know cancers or or tr tries to um, you know what I'm saying. There's there's a there's a systematic function that preserves the auto. But yet, it, there's a contradiction in which we are, are not never auto. I think I think there is also. I'm not a specialist here. I I would. I'm sure that there is many aspects and 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 so, so, subtle issues that have to be unpacked here. But I think one of the arguments that they are making, uh, 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 Varela and, and and his colleagues, is really to try to differentiate a bacterium from a from from a virus, right? Because in your definition of symbiopoiesis, well, both would fit. Um, yeah, everything would fit. Well, and, and the issue is what characterizes life? Because life is actually connected to consciousness. Th there's a question by uh, Milton, if he, if he would like to. Yeah, Professor, this is wonderful and interesting and intriguing, and I, I'm finding the word resonance keeps coming to my mind, uh, that this resonance is between the architect and the world and what's manifested from that, the, that, intercon that interconnection and that act of design. And the same occurs, that resonance occurs, may not be exactly the same, but it's the same kind of relationship between the person who lives in the world and experiences that architecture. So I'm, I'm struck by that. Um, so I, that's the word that I, I'm thinking of. And to build on Maria's comment about, it wasn't Maria, I'm sorry, about older architects, maybe it was Maria. It was Lily, Lily. It was Lily, hi. Um, I'm an older architect. And what I find is that in my students and in my own career, that the hardest thing to do is poetry. And we often design buildings and then paint affect on them. Oops, this doesn't feel like the client's needs. Or what is the sense of the client? What is the sense of the moment? What is the mood? And we try to inject it after the form has been generated and after that architecture is, is really, in a sense, stillborn because it doesn't have the life in it to create resonance. So part of my work is to see if there are ways to embody or to, to take affect and make it into a design agenda. Yes. I which, brings you, which brings you into resonance and brings you I think toward poetry. Nothing, nothing makes it into poetry, but brings you in that direction. Yes, that's very interesting, Milton. Of course, I agree completely. I mean, that has been my concern. That's why I got into uh, like the, trying to 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 deal with the concept of of uh, of uh, Stimmung, of course, that then in German becomes well, when you translate it from uh, from German, particularly the idea that the the Stimmung is not is is misunderstood when it's something only interior, but it's also outside. Is this kind of con uh, con condition that is both internal and external? Then it it stands for atmosphere and and the, the atmospheric uh, as a potentially aesthetic category that is really what what would uh, enable the resonance that you are talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's what uh, that's what interests me as well. Uh, in my in my recent book, I've tried to to uh, to um, to champion the importance of literary tools in, 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 in design, precisely because literary language has the capacity to express quali qualitative conditions of the environment in such a poignant way, mm -hmm. so that, that if we can find ways to, to, to in integrate 
um, uh, literary tools with the other design tools that are our, our, at, at our fingertips, I think we might be better uh, situated precisely to produce these kinds of resonances that I think you're you are talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to add a little bit to that, the word poignance, I think, is wonderful because that's the, the deepest connection to something. And the sock space is poignant. The Taj Mahal is poignant. The, the pyramids are lots of things, but not quite poignant. But even sock is not poignant all the time. Yeah. There's an atmospheric situation that's involved in that. So sometimes, you know, when the sun sets or it's foggy, it is a very different experience. And I think that sense of connection yeah. is atmospheric. It's not just in the object. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. I think this is a really interesting point, and it also reminds me of something Alberto said that depending depending on our environment, we can also try to be in a room, light some candles, and then create an atmosphere that makes it a little bit more agreeable, more more um, atmospheric, and so on. But uh, picking up on what uh, Milton was saying, if if we start from there instead of just trying to adapt something to have this. In, to inject, like Milton said, uh, to inject this quality. Perhaps, perhaps if we think about it from the beginning, we have more chances of being successful. And also a very interesting aspect that I, I find in what you just mentioned, Alberto, with this connection to, to language and to literary language, because um, that's, that's really where we can access this level of poetry and this uh, level of meaning that can bring us close to, the, to these uh, qualities or the qualia, like they call also in neuroscience, uh, which is also something that I still don't see too much addressed in the discussion between architecture and neuroscience. I see it in your work, I, I hear you specifically talking about this, but I think it's something largely unexplored and I, I would like uh, Eduardo is here. I don't know if he's still connected to us, but because we have a neuroscientist, I would like, if he would like to join in this conversation to hear the perspective from, from a neuroscientist on this possibility of working with the qualia in architecture. Maybe not. You have to unmute yourself, Eduardo. We can hear you. So I, I've been listening, trying very hard to take some notes to see what, um, where I relate to this conversation. Um, there, is, there is a tendency to, I think among those of us who actually practice neuroscience and, and try to understand circuits and stuff like that, to, to uh, not venture too much into concepts that are difficult to define. And uh, something called qualia to me is somewhat ethereal. I mean, I, I understand, I think, what is meant by the word. I think I have an idea uh, of where there is and where there isn't. But I, I am having a difficult time actually bringing neuroscience and architecture together. We seem to be talking a little bit uh, in parallel and in diverging ways rather than trying to converge. And so I've been taking some notes to see what, what will I discuss next week. And I had thought I would talk about um, wayfinding and uh, some, some sort of the the practical aspects of the fact that our brains, we, we're building for brains that are all different and which change over our lifespans. And, um, you know, any kind of definition that is appropriate for a particular person at a particular time is dynamic, it's changing. And uh, so I'm trying to figure out where all of these very interesting concepts um, are appropriate for a conversation between a neuroscientist and an architect. So maybe Milton can respond to that. Unmute, Milton. Eduardo, Eduardo I, I got it. Um, yeah, I think there is a way actually. And, and if there are words that come from Alberto and come from the poetry of architecture, 
and you let you let um, there be a not a vocabulary, but an encyclopedia of images or video experiences, which which people who design or or consider the poetry of architecture agree about. Put them in the fMRI. Let's see what lights up, and see if there is something that can be replicated. See if there's something that is. Um, uh, patterned, it involves a pattern of facts and see if that leads to another way to think about the research. In other words, I think there is a way to put someone, because the whole person experiences what we're talking about. Can we put the whole person's brain and then you as a neuroscientist and say, oh, well, you know, that's happening in the hippocampus and then it's, the singular gyrus is being activated at the same time. What does that mean? Well, that's the question, Milton. What does it mean? Right, right. I mean, when when uh, Alberto talks about autopoiesis, right, and uh, then we hear from Sarah about symbiopoiesis, and you know, it's uh, and and Alberto brings up consciousness for bacteria. I'm get I get a little lost, right, because I even if I put a bacterium in an MRI, I'm not going to see very much of anything. Um, so the, que the question really is what, we bring somewhat different values to this, this conversation, right? I mean, I'm really, I really like the idea that we can come up with some concepts that help the human condition, particularly as the human condition changes through growing up and growing old and uh, becoming somewhat uh, neurodegenerated and so on. You know, it would be interesting to see really if there are principles of, of attachment or, you know, some kind of responses to specific, um, you know, features of, of the way we see and think and embody ourselves in the world that would be a you know, something I can add to the quality of life at certain times in life, right? Yeah, I mean, this is, I think this is where we're trying to converge really is how our understanding merges at some point. Yeah, sorry, Albert. No, no, it's okay, it's fantastic. The, the problem is that maybe you cannot, one could not make a, a method out of this, right? Like, like we know, for instance, that a person with Alzheimer's suffers more if the person is taken out of a familiar environment. It's kind of obvious. But I mean, these things, these things uh, the, the, the way that the environment is, uh, affects us, I don't think can ever be ultimately made into some kind of method. That's perhaps the problem. Uh, so we can learn, I think, from exactly what, uh, what Milton was saying. You know, it's what I think the neurophenomenologists are trying to do like uh, take seriously first person accounts and then look at the fMRI and see how this collate, how this correlate, and we may learn something, but to make it into something practical and uh, applicable, like from the top down, I think would be probably impossible. That's my, that's my, that's what we start. We have something to learn from neuroscience, but I think it's, uh, uh, th that difference probably has to be recognized. I, I, I was just thinking when you were guys, when, uh, when this question was, was, uh, came up, I don't know if you know, uh, uh, you and Maria, uh, uh, Giovanna Colombetti, you know this woman that worked with Ivan Thompson and uh, wrote a book called The Feeling Body, Affective Science Meets the Enactive Mind? Because I think she's really trying very hard precisely to deal with these questions of how quali qualitative can actually be understood in terms of at least some kind of cognitive theory, even though I'm sure that some cognitive theoreticians might not grant <laughs> a status to someone like Alba Noe, or I, I don't know. I mean, you know, there are, there are all these debates about, uh, about cognitive science as well. But, uh, but this, it's an interesting book, uh, Maria, Giovanna Colombetti, I guess she's Italian originally. I didn't uh, read it, but I, I heard about it. But uh, just to pick up this thread and also in connection to, to what I was uh, asking Eduardo before, um, because we also have this emerging new field of uh, neuroesthetics. 
that tries to bring together neuroscience and the tools of neuroscience to try to understand scientifically the aesthetic experience. Yes. Um, and, and for example, in music, this is something that is already done. There are many bands, contemporary bands, especially in electronic music, that use knowledge to, from neuroscience to activate certain uh, patterns in the brain by, by working with the frequencies. And this is, this is something that uh, in many ways has to do with these, with these qualia, because there are def definitely sensory and, and emotional um, uh, sure. effects uh, through the, working with these correlations. Yeah. But, well, that's true also with, uh, I mean, you're, it may be easier to explain with respect to music, but we also have periodicities in the visual world which resonate. I mean, we're, we create things that, that also produce uh, a heightening of a response. We may not be quite as aware and we need to analyze them a little better because we think of, uh, of things like betas and alphas and gamma waves and so on. It's kind of easier to think in the, in the temporal domain, but our visual experience is also in the temporal domain. And we also have resonances from visual input onto you know, the wave patterns that we're creating in our, in our heads. The issue is, is, do we want to know more so we can interfere? Mm -hmm. Do we want to know more so that we can have orgasms of, uh, of waves or, you know, what, what is it that we're looking for mm -hmm. here, right? And uh, I think, anyway, I, I will pose some of these questions for our conversation next week and see how we go with it. Yes, I'm really looking forward to it also. <laughs> Eduardo, I'm fascinated by the idea of the dialogue and the difficulties in the dialogue uh, between architects and poets and neuroscientists. And what occurs to me is that the brainstorming that happens when you start to wade into a question, that we, instead of saying, here's the question we'd like you to answer, oh, neuroscientists, and you go off and you think about it and say, that's not something neuroscientists, neuroscience can address. If instead your perspective and the perspective of the architects, which is what Anfa is supposed to be bring together, is to wade in, not jump, just to slowly wade in with conversation. You know, for example, I would say neuroaesthetics. Let's find out if ugly is associated with cortisol and, and beauty is associated with endorphins. And, and I think that there are ways to wade into that conversation that might be able to help us define ugly and beauty and also look at those productions of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, cortisol and endorphins and other neurotransmitters and other, and other uh, expressors. So I, I'd like to find a forum for that where we can really sit around, have a couple of beers, have a couple glasses of wine and just start to think of ways that we can, we can find ground with each other. I think wine is required. Yeah, well, you want endorphins, right? So <laughs> can I ask Anything? you a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and then I would like to give the word to our students because they are a little bit quiet and I think that they have many questions. <laughs> Just one short question. I, it occurs to me as we're bringing up research and knowledge and things like that, that um, a lot of times, um, well, I just wondered if neuroscience, are there any qualitative studies done in neuroscience. It seems to me that architecture draws on a lot of social science like anthropology. I mean, we really resonate, I really resonate with anth anthropological studies, um, which are qualitative. And uh, so I just wonder in neuroscience, are there valid, I mean, are there, I, I know it's empirical data collected quantitatively and, you know, there's, but are there any qualitative studies? And 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 do you do you value so so for, for for example, like if I wanted to study your favorite dish, Eduardo, your favorite meal, right? Mm -hmm. And if I broke it down reductively to see the molecules and the chemicals and what makes up your your favorite dish, I could do that. We but we could never get there, maybe, you know, what is the meaning of why is it your favorite food? But we could do a qualitative study about how this food was prepared and why you affectively or biologically are attracted to this food. 
we could do a qualitative study about it that might yield some very valuable information. So I'm just wondering, is there something similar in neuroscience that, that architects like myself can relate to, perhaps? I, I think it's an interesting question. I think that um, a lot of neuroscience, I, you know, we're using neuroscience in a very loose way, right? Because a lot of what we're talking about is cognitive science and psychology. And so if you go towards the behavioral and a lot of it is in fact descriptive and you find examples and percentages and, and, uh, and people try to make a, 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 um, a, a more concrete statement, I think that in many cases it's warranted. Even if you have MRI, even if you have numbers and so on, a lot of, a lot of what you conclude really is interpretative. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have you know, painting with five colors. The five is not significant. Maybe comparing a five color painting to a six color painting, but the numbers don't mean much. It's, it's the pattern, right? It's something about it that leads you to an aesthetic response. So numerology by itself is not science. It's not science, right? So if people claim, well, I've done this experiment and so on, and I get these numbers, that, that does not mean that it is particularly more meaningful than you know, some other studies, which are more qualitative. Anyway, I think, I think that uh, you know, it's a fascinating question because I think that both neuroscientists and architects overreach from what they think they understand and try to make statements that are, in my mind, not, not I mean, they're interesting. I'm not saying they're not interesting. And, or, you know, as, as Milton would say, hey, let's go have a, a glass of wine and talk about these very interesting things. I'm not sure we want to reach or, or we should expect to reach, uh, you know, some conclusive specific predictive kind of theory that will allow us to uh, improve quality of life. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so now I would like to ask our students because <laughs> we already have been over a little bit some time, if they would like to have some questions, because I know yeah. that, yeah, Mario, please. One. Uh, thank you, first of all, so much for your talk. It is, it is really, really interesting. I can't stop listening to you uh, go on and on. Uh, but I've got, uh, it's funny because we had a course prior to this one this afternoon where we kind of like talked about architecture and what architecture means to us and what we think about when we uh, are trying to do architecture, what brings us joy and what is stressful for us and so on and so on. Um, so it didn't uh, go that deep into the discussion as it is going like now. But uh, one point that we um, kind of like um, found out is the fact that we all agreed that architecture is kind of like an extendment to ourselves. So we had this um, example that, for instance, if we pre uh, present our uh, architecture that we do uh, in different groups or alone at uni, there's always this kind of fear that uh, our professors don't like it very much. And it's kind of like uh, we are exposing ourselves uh, with a fragment of ourselves to the public and to everyone to be judged on by. So I was just uh, wondering, uh, Alberto, if you would agree that architecture is kind of an extension to your own body and kind of like a piece of yourself. Huh. Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, one thing, one, one thing, one of the fundamental, I think, problems for contemporary practicing architects is that we are, yes, we're expected to put ourselves on the line, like you described, but at the same time, we know this is part of, this is really the, 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 the paradox of contemporary culture 
that we can never be, we can never generate something that is really as rich as the culture itself can could generate. I mean, we all, you know, we all have this awareness of how incredibly powerful qualitatively is what we call architecture without architects. This is the, the what Rudowski uh, studies very nicely. Uh, that, that is really generated from, from the skills of a, of a culture that build up over time and then create something which is incredibly rich. In contemporary world, because of the conditions of our technological global village, the architect is basically asked to put himself or herself on the line while knowing that it's impossible, <laughs> yes, or at least knowing if you are wise, that it, it would be futile to even ex to expect that you can do that. Uh, so you are always at a kind of disadvantage. I think all you could do, all I, all I tell my students to do is, uh, is to, to think of the other with great compassion, with great empathy, to try to establish some kind of conversation where you really understand the other in the other's own terms, um, in, a, in a humble way, you know, and the, the, there is a, a Christian concept which is called kenosis, which is like a diminution or emptying it, emptying of yourself that allows you to be receptive to, to others and that uh, would hopefully enable you to, uh, to, to do good, to, to contribute to the common good. Um, so, so yes, I, I mean, the answer of, to your question is yes. I think you're, of course, you know, one, one is always putting oneself on the, on the line. And that is also why I insist with my students that you have to have a firm self-understanding to be able to express yourself where you where you stand when you propose something when you make a project because a project is a promise for others and if you have never if you don't have this kind of self awareness that is really what i would say is a kind of you would like a, a philosophical outlook and understanding of of what matters to you in relation to the big questions of the world if you don't have that kind of at the core then uh, then the the, the practice is going to come back to bite you. Like after, after a few years of doing stupid instrumental work to, to please the clients, where you participate in the machinery of production, you will probably end up feeling rather miserable. Uh, you know? And of course, not everybody develops or, or be, you know, becomes uh, sort of uh, afflicted by this kind of self-consciousness, but a lot of people do. So, so I, I would, I, I think it's important to understand that, that you really need this kind of language to, and to, 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 uh, to articulate your, your responsibility, you know, in, in the here and now when you act, when you propose something for others, you are ultimately responsible, yes. And, uh, and it's a tough profession. I don't think it's easy because of these conditions, you know, of, of, of the contemporary technological world that way but uh, it's better to have some clarity about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Mario. That was a great question. Uh, Luis would like to make a comment. Hello, everyone. Hello, Alberto. Nice to see Hi. you. Nice to see uh, you. One question is about, and this is something that you talk in other talks, and this is something that is really interesting. And I would like to, you to talk about this. I think that would be very interesting for your students as well. Uh, what about the narratives? There's something that you talk about how you put yourself into the project, but you always connect uh, stories or you connect the way you understand the world and put it together when you are designing. And for me, that's one of the most important things when we are designing, like you create a narrative that, I mean, can be poetic, can be romantic, but also can, also, can be very... Uh, it could have a lot of uh, instrumentalism, as you mentioned, or, or methodologies, but it's something that you connect with your client. Like as soon as you start a conversation, let's say uh, when I design a house, I remember one of my clients asked me uh, that they were, uh, they had a childhood, a very interesting childhood with their grandma's house. And they loved to have the smell of jasmine in the house. You know? and, and that was an important part of their life. And this is something that came up they, they came up with this because I was asking, do you have something that you want to share with me that is independent from an architecture that you remember from your childhood that is really important for you? And she said, yes, I really love when I used to go to my grandma's house 
and there was this smell of jasmine. So if there's some way that we can introduce that in the house, that would be fantastic. So for me, that became an interesting <clears throat> narrative, an interesting story to tell. And from there, I, in the middle of the house, that would be for, you know, for the smell of, of jasmine. So this is something that I believe is part of the narrative. Now, this is something that we also, this, because we're connecting, and I'm connecting myself with the client and putting myself in their shoes. So somehow I would like you to talk a lot about, a, a little bit about the, the narrative what, when you talk about these narratives. Yes, Luis, you, you're very kind. Uh, it's it's very it's it's very good observation. It's a very good example that you give. I completely agree. It's a huge. It would be a huge a huge lecture for me to give. It's a huge, it's a huge topic, right? Uh, how narratives operate because they operate at, at many different levels, uh, uh, and I speak about this in, in 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 a few of my in my two my two most recent books. I there are chapters on this uh, whole chapters on this problem. Uh, I don't know what would be most salient. You're absolutely right. One aspect of narrative that is very important is that it allows you to engage ethically with others. Because we are very concerned today with this promise of social justice, right? As architects, you know, it's all over the, like Black Lives Matter. This is really part of the, it has somehow uh, become very present in our lives. It should always have been there. I mean, it has always been, I thought the thing has always been a concern in, in my thinking about architecture, but it's very present. How, do one, how does one make, how does one uh, design in a way that really matters for others? And I think narrative is, is, a, very, is a very crucial uh, aspect. I mean, when you have a, like star architects that have some kind of brand and basically land projects from California all the way to Saudi Arabia, you wonder, right, what that means because there's really no, no engagement in the way that precisely you're speaking about, things that matter that would have to emerge from some kind of, of, uh, of, of, of narrative uh, um, fusion is the term that is used in hermeneutics, a kind of fusion of horizons between the designer and, and, and the client the, 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 that you are designing for. So that's, that's one aspect, but, but narrative is, is huge. You know, someone like, um, like Paul Ricoeur would argue that the only way to get at who we are is really by understanding that we are the stories that we make about ourselves. So that your, 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 uh, your ethical being, the person that wakes up every morning and that we know it change, you know, your brain changes like we were being told by, by our colleague the, in neuroscience, the brain changes when you're a child and when you are older, but the, the person that you recognize yourself as being generally constant when you wake up every morning is this kind of narrative self you tell me who are you and I give you the story of the kind of story of my life somehow and so it's it, the, the narrative is really uh, crucial at that level for in hermeneutics it's also um, a way and this is something that Paul Ricoeur himself uh, speculates to construct um, to construct a work I mean he's basically talking about literature but he also wrote a little essay in which he tries to apply these categories to architecture, where he talks about uh, three, three aspects of narrative that allow, he calls it prefiguration, configuration, and refiguration, which he uses to, to, to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, you know, prefiguration in architecture would be something to do with the program. Like you, the, what we call the program, which is usually reduced to a, to a set of, uh, of, uh, of parts with square feet or with square meters, you can actually make into a narrative, which is really like a, a, a vision of future life, which is like a prefiguration of the life that might take place in the architecture that you are promising. The configuration, which might be the use of similar language to evoke the qualities of the spaces that you are designing that could contribute as tools to the design process. And what he calls refiguration are actually the, it, he uses it really to talk about, about how we read a book. Like when you read a novel, the, the, the author prefigures and configures the text and you refigure it. You, the moment you read it, you make it again into a reality, which is the way that the client would eventually live in the places that you are designing. So, it, so there are these aspects, they are all narrative aspects. They are all can be actually understood through narrative tools 
Uh, and, and so th this could co this contribute in, in different ways to the configuration of a project. And then, you know, more generally speaking, of course, the, the, the inheritance that we have from, from the past comes to us through narrative forms, uh, which are also, it's what we call history. And that we, we and, and, that, and that is really what the architectural history is really stories, that, that it's not really a collection of buildings or styles, it's really stories that have to do with how uh, architecture has answered to questions that are important in certain times and places. These stories actually help you to understand how your own story might be appropriate, ethical or not. For example, if you know uh, the history of, uh, of uh, incarceration of prisons, you realize that 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 you know you you may not do a good thing if you if you are designing a prison from so, for some government <laughs> where the people that are going to be put in prison are disadvantaged drug uh, addicts that basically they are it's a disease it's a, it's it's not a it's not a moral failure and the people that are really evil will never come there will never be put there i mean think about trump right so i mean so are you going to design a prison you will not design a prison. You just have to know a little bit about history. These are stories as well. So all that is narrative. So it's a huge topic, but you, but you are, but I agree. And with your example, is perfect. The way that you engage with some, with others uh, in through storytelling is an incredibly important element for your design to give others something that is going to be worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I would like to ask our students, I think Ono would like to make a comment because I noticed. Actually, I was uh, thinking about questions, but I, I think I'm still uh, getting all that information through my head right now. So <laughs> maybe maybe I will uh, write an email if I, if I, I an email, get... please. yes, I will be. I always answer emails. You, you can, you can feel free to write me an email. I will be delighted to answer. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. That's wonderful, Alberto. I'm very happy to know that our students can uh, contact you because I, th I, I think that maybe today, now at the moment, they are a little bit overwhelmed because we had we had two sessions and so many new threads and we had all this input, really valuable input, also from our guests. Uh, and it has be, really been uh, wonderful, Alberto, to have you here. It's been a pleasure, Maria. It's very nice to meet you all, and we'll be in touch. Yes, please email me. I answer. I answer my emails. I'm good at that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, if there aren't any more questions, maybe maybe we can end. Uh, we can end for now. And again, Alberto, thank you so much for being here. Maria, you're very kind. Very nice to see you. Very nice to see you all. Nice to see you. And I really hope that we can, in the future, that we can meet uh, in person. <laughs> because of course, I hope so. It would be although, nice. <laughs> although this was already, this was already a very meaningful experience. Always very nice, but yeah, a glass of wine always helps. <laughs> <laughs> also, like Milton was saying, absolutely. <laughs> Keeping us warmer. Okay. Take care, so. Keep safe, please. Eh? <laughs> see you next Wishing time. Wishing you all the best. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.